Today, everybody, let us now start with the last lesson of this unit, <clears throat> Literature from Mindanao. So in this discussion, we are going to talk about the different literary pieces commonly attributed to Mindanao, the second largest group of island or the second largest island in the Philippines. Now, I want you to take down notes in this discussion for this will bear very important no? uh, stories, concepts, ideas, and origin stories basically of how Mindanao came to be and how the island, the island's culture as well as the island's geography influences the different literature in Mindanao. So in this lesson, we have the following objectives that we need to aim. First is to identify some of the major literary works from Mindanao and relate the theme and message of literature from Mindanao into the present context. So it is important that as we go along with our discussion, we are going to always remember that our discussions in this lesson should also be linked into the present day context of how these literature from Mindanao influences right, the people in Mindanao. Now, Here's a very essential question that we are going to answer as we go along with our discussion. What is the contribution of Mindanao literature to the culture of the Philippines? Since we have already identified the possible contribution or influences of literature from Luzon and Visayas to the culture of the Philippines, this time, let's try to unlock what is the contribution of Mindanao literature to the culture of the Philippines. Now, with that being said, here are the different vocabulary words that we are going to encounter as we go along with our discussion. So take note of them because these not only add up to our new words in our to the new words in our vocabulary, but this also helps us engage the lessons, the stories, the examples, the discussion in general in a more interactive and comprehensive manner given that we are already aware to, as to what these words mean. So let's begin. First, we have the word fortress. Fortress is a noun which means a large military stronghold. Example, although the invading army was large, the king was confident in the defenses of his fortress. Second, fries. Fries is a noun which means a horizontal band of sculptures or decorations on the wall near the ceiling found in old structures. Example, the temple was well preserved. Even the fries on the interior, was, interior wall seemed good as new. Another is buckler. Buckler is a noun which means a small, round shield usually worn on the forearm. Example, the warrior went out to meet his foe with sword and buckler at the ready. Fourth, convent. Convent is a verb which means an, absol an obsolete word that means to gather. Example, in the modern language, we say to convene instead of to convent. And lastly is exhort. Exhort is a verb which means to strongly encourage someone to action. Example, the senator tried to exhort the citizens to stop believing the lies of the ruling dictator. So these are the different vocabulary words that we are going to come across with the examples and the discussions that we are going to have so make sure that you are going to jot them down so that we can remember them as we go along with our discussion for today. Alright, now let's begin learning about Mindanao literature. First, let's try to talk about the salient points when we tell or when we say Mindanao. What are the common ideas or points that come across our mind when we say Mindanao? Mindanao is the second largest island group in the Philippines. It is divided into six regions. The Davao region, the Zamboanga Peninsula, Northern Mindanao, Sok Sargen, ARMM or now BARMM or BARM, and the Caraga region. 
Some of the major regional languages include Chavacano, Maguindanao, Maranao, and Tausug. Mindanao is generally inhabited by Muslims, but although they are no longer a majority, the Islamic culture is still evident. Unlike Luzon and Visayas, Mindanao was not entirely colonized by the Spaniards. Now, there are large groups of ethnic minorities in Mindanao. These include Maranao, Maguindanao, Ilanon, and Sangil, also referred to as Moro. Groups found in the uplands include the Bagobo, Bukidnon, Mandaya, Manobo, and Subanon. Every ethnic minority has a number of raconteurs or narrators who deliver a story in a creative way, bearing two or three or more folk tales. The stories they tell have been conveyed to them by older members of their respective families, friends, and acquaintances, some of whom have already died. Raconteurs can be young or old, men or women. There's no such prejudice with the narrators of these different groups of majorities. Now, let's now discuss the different examples of literature from Mindanao. Take note for this may unravel some of the most common questions that come, our, that come in our mind when we talk about the different occurrences or phenomena in our locality, given that we are all from Mindanao. First, we have the origin of Davao, or the Davao region. This is an account of the beginning of Davao. It is about the natives of Davao called Klagans. I had the distinct opportunity to witness the different tribes and ethnic groups residing in the city of Davao. No? Majority are from the Davao region, but in that particular activity, we were able to gather the major tribes or ethnic groups residing in Davao City. There, I learned a lot about the different literature of these uh, tribes or ethnic groups, as well as the culture in which they practice day-to-day -day living. So they are very vast and diverse. Although there are similarities, but then again, it is still filled with a lot of uh, diversity that will really steer interest into our uh, minds. No? Another example of literature from Mindanao is from the Zamboanga Peninsula, which is Agtubig no Keboklagan. This is an epic story of tra uh, story translated as the Kingdom of Keboklagan. It is considered as one of the oldest epics in Zamboanga. It is chanted or performed during their week-long Buklog festival. And it tells the life and adventures of an extraordinary hero named Taake. Let's talk about more examples, this time from northern Mindanao. This story is entitled, How Cagayan de Oro Got Its Name. This is a legend explaining the origin of the name of the province, which means shameful peace. So we are going to get to know about how Cagayan de Oro got, got its name, na in translation would mean shameful peace. In from the Soxargen region, the Ulahingan. This is an epic about the adventures of Agyu and his relatives who had a conflict with their rulers. As they flee from their place, they were guided by a diwata. So, we also have from the BARMM or the BARM, the Maguindanao tale of the faithful wife. This folk tale is about an aged man's last words to his son, telling him that he should never marry a widow and only choose a young lady. And of course, we, have, we also have from the Karaga region, the Tulalang. This folk tale is about Tulalang, the firstborn of a poor couple. One day, he went into the forest to gather some food. When he was collecting crops, an old lady approached him and pitied their poor life. She said that they will never be hungry and they can get anything they want. 
Soon after, they had a prosperous life. So these are only the salient points. Kumbaga, the, the highlights or the synopsis of these different literar literary examples that all originate from the different regions of Mindanao. Of course, there is more you know, to the plot of these different literary pieces or literature which we are going to be tackling. Now, let's try to visit the Manobo epic entitled Ulahingan, the visit of Lagabaan to Nelendangan. Allow me now to read to you the story of or this Manobo epic entitled Ulahingan, the visit of Lagabaan to Nelendangan. Nalandangan is the later name of an ancient city fortress called, called by different names. Among them, Yendang, Manengneng, Libalan, and Niwilian. A chosen people loved by the highest god of the sky world dwell in the fortress city. They have come from Aruman. By, around, by riding a huge ship. The people built the city, a huge structure along the seashore at the mouth of a river using trees for pillars. The trees were so big that eight men were needed to link hands around each one. The beams pointed to the east. Their tips decked with statues of reptiles carved with their mouths open, dagger-like teeth exposed. The hair of the mermaid and the locks of the deity, Alimugkat, goddess of the seas, layered with grass from the sky world, made up the roof of the fortress. One on the eaves was a frieze of statues of dazzling red warriors, and on top of the building were two warriors of gold, each armed with a spear, a shield, and a buckler, both poised for battle. West of the building was a statue of a beautiful maiden washing herself in a stream. In the east, a statue of a golden eagle with wings outspread. Surrounding the building were shrubs and flowering plants. The huge palace also had a courtyard of silver and a playground of glass. A mountain of destroyed shields and bucklers, spear shafts and uprooted trees hemmed in a battlefield. Scattered around were the teeth, skulls, or hair of previous invaders. Agius' room, called the Benyasan, was coated with paint nine times over. The bathing place of the maidens were fenced by boulders to protect them from sharks and crocodiles. The floor was made of silver, the inside wall of glass. There were also bathing places for the married women. For Agyu, the hero, and for the young men, they never removed their armor even when they bathed. Nalandangan also had fortifications. Each of the well-known warriors, Kuyasu, nephew of Agyu, Seiluen, the son, Peglibu, the brother, Banlak or Vanlak, another brother, Nabeyas, another son, and Agyu was assigned a fort. Agyu's fort was built of iron and steel. This fort was specially provided with a cover on which eight or ten men could perform the Saul. Invaders reached no farther than the opening of the fort. After a period of peace came an eventful time for the people and warriors of Nalandangan. Elbowing one another and splattering battle quid onto the floor, the people were assembled in the palace. Agyu's brother, Lena or Lono, had convented the people to an assembly while Agyu had been sleeping for days. When he woke up, Agyu asked his wife for the water container to wash his face and for the battle chew. Directing his eyes to Lena, the favorite son of Nalandangan, 
Agyu recited his foreboding dream about the darkness and destruction of Nalandangan. He had dreamt that hardwood trees were uprooted and flung to distant places, and the cliffs of the sea were turned to dust. Pigyugong or Pemuliu, Agyu's older brother, dreamt that invaders had come. Agyu wanted to offer a prayer because he thought that the goddess of fate had forsaken him and his people. Thunder boomed. Unperturbed, Lena laughed faintly and said that the morrow will show whether or not they were an abandoned people. Just then, the invaders reached the fortress. Lena ordered the young people to arm themselves. They grabbed weapons from the piles of shields and spears, and they delighted in putting on their battle gear again after a long time. Van Lak, the younger brother of Agyu, shouted that he would lead the attack against the darkness that had invoked that had enveloped the fortress of Nalandangan. Agyu's son, Nebeyeu, was just as ready as many other young men. With his plume, he paced around the courtyard like a cock at the edge of the lawn. Soon, he was fighting the invaders who fell like fruit from a tree. He raised his arm, and from it came a flame that lit the place revealing that the darkness had caused a magic iron rod to disable or devour many of Agyu's followers. Lena armed himself carefully, with the orioles hovering over his plume, signifying that his diwata was guiding and protecting him. That he leaped onto action, onto the pebbled arena, and he sunk deep there up to his belt. He instructed his shield and buckler to be firmly rooted to the foundation of the underworld. Then, the enormous magic iron rod warned him to be ready because he might be blown by a storm or swallowed up by a mighty wind. The iron rod then withdrew to the sea and from there trotted back to the battlefield, knocking Lena's shield and buckler to pieces. Lena leaped overhead grappled with the rod and threw it to outer space. The rod devastated every kingdom that it passed. When it returned, it warned Lena of its revenge. The rod tried to gnaw Lena's slender waist, but Lena's waist was alloyed. Then Lena grabbed the rod and locked together, they spun until Lena smashed it against the hardwood trees in the cliff turning them into a wasteland. Lena then implored his protecting Diwata to turn his legs with anklets into sharp swords and his limbs into sabers. With them, he splintered and powdered the monster of iron. But out of the splinters and powder appeared a fleet of invading ships. In one ship was a king, and from all came a thousand troops. They landed and destroyed the plantations, the trees, and gardens. The people of Yendang were fettered on the decks of the ships. Lena leaped onto the decks and pulverized the chain that bound them by simply touching it. His freed followers were transported back to the spacious courtyard. A toddler welcomed the old king to Yendang. As the king sat at the portal of the courtyard, he was directed to see for himself his own ships being splintered and strewn around. Unmoved, the king only encouraged his followers to continue devastating the gardens and plantations. Lena chased the invaders around, and they assembled at the seashore. Their king exhorted them to shout and to knock their shields to produce a thunderous peal by which the, to frighten the inhabitants of Yendang. The local folks responded by following Lena's instructions to produce an even more deafening sound that drowned out the invaders' shouts and banging of shields. Then Lena told his followers to dance the Saut. The war dance was just a warm-up to the fighting that ensued at the lawn. 
Both young and old warriors participated in the battle. The enemies fled, but they were chased up to the underbushes of the mountains where they were decimated. The king of the invaders told his aide to, to save his men. The aide planted his shield, which became a cliff in the middle of the lawn to shelter their warriors. Although he claimed it was for the people who are scared of the fighting, either the UN, Agus' cousin, or the Lemenen, his son, knocked the shield away. The Lemenen speared the king's aid, losing his aid. The king armed himself. He commanded his anklets and ringlets to ring the place up to the mountains and hills, making the place an impenetrable jungle. The king also commanded his shield and buckler to grow taller and wider until they were fastened to the gilded beams of the palace, becoming a blocking cliff. The king taunted Lena to bypass the obstacle. Lena did not take the challenge right away, but he performed the saut. As he did so, he kicked the obstacles along the seashore. Then Lena moved to the lawn and tested the strength and solidity of the planted shield and buckler of the king, who again taunted him. The shield and buckler received greater pressure from Lena, and they confessed that they were like ropes snapping. Lena soon turned them into splinters. Lena fought with the king. The king's spear and javelin were ground to dust. Then they fought with their daggers and kampilan blades, but Lena turned his opponent's blades to dust. The two wrestled, and as they were grappling, a smoke arose in their midst, but neither one of them yielded. Lena then hurled himself skyward to look for the sipa, or ball of the sky. With this ball, he encased the king, who, however, freed himself easily. The king shackled Lena's feet. The fetters were attached to a gigantic tree and a balite tree, which was ordered to fasten its trunk to the land of the dead and the gilded beam of the palace. However, Lena freed himself easily. Lena retaliated by hurling the king up into space, but the king returned to the courtyard. Confronting Lena, he used the hair of a deity to bind him, and although Lena could wriggle, he could not free himself. Meanwhile, in another land lived one of Agu's relatives, Tegyekua, Agu's first wife, and their son, Kumugpa. The boy had been crying the whole day long, and to stop him, the mother promised him that they will visit his father, Agyu, if he ceases to cry. When they arrived at Yendang, they find Lena already bound. Tigyekua then approached Lena and touched the hair that binds him, and he was freed. She also identified Lena's adversary as his true father, who has never visited Nalandangan before. The king's eyes moistened, unable to recognize the multitude of his children, his grandchildren, and his great-great-grandchildren. So, these are the different guide questions that follows from that very long epic of heroes that originate in a very, very beautiful tribe as well. So, what did you learn from that? And how are you able to answer? these guide questions with the comprehension that we have garnered out of our story or our epic. Make sure that we are going to read it again if in case the epic is not clear, right? For our understanding that we may be able to address these guide questions comprehensively and extensively. Now, as we do, we are going to integrate the values that we have learned from this lesson. This is the same question that I posed when we talked about literatures from Luzon and Visayas. But a very important question is something that we can put into context given that we are from Mindanao. How does learning about literature from Mindanao help you gain a better appreciation of Philippine culture? 
given that we are much able to relate on the culture that we have here in our in our locality in our community in mindanao in general how does learning about literature from mindanao help us better appreciate philippine culture and as we do let us also identify that as Mindanaoans, what are the best qualities or traits that we can offer to become better Filipinos in general? Make sure that you have jotted down important and salient points of this discussion and raise questions or clarifications during our online feedbacking. That's all.